Manny Rivera Neto from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, his presentation is entitled Monitoring What You Need to Know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you, FSR, for the uh, for the invite. Thank you for you uh, for coming. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, to be here. So um, every time that I this is my first time in Iowa, and every time that I go to a new place, I try to you know read a little bit about it, try to become familiar, uh, uh, know all the good things to do. So I, I try to read a little bit. I went to the Iowa website, very nice website great state, a lot of uh, nice things to do. I like outdoors thing, I like bike, I like road trips, so you can actually plan your road trip there. And I, I may do that in the uh, near future with my family. But I wanted to know a little more. I have a friend that lives in Iowa, or actually he's from Iowa, he lives in Cleveland now. So I asked him, tell me a little bit more about Iowa. Uh, Iowa. What is like a must thing, uh, thing that I need to, uh, need to do or need to go to? So he sent me uh, this picture. <laughs> And then I read about the state fair, but it's in August. So now I need to come back in August with my family for the, uh, for the state fair. Um, but anyways, a pleasure to be here. And uh, we are not here to talk about the state fair. We are here to talk about how to monitor your disease, right? And I wanted to try to make this really useful for you. So I thought of three things that I think you need to know to monitor your disease well. And those are the three points that I want you to take from this lecture today. So one is, uh, try to find out together, of course, with your doctor, where is the sarcoidosis in your body? This is one important thing to know if you wanna monitor your disease well. Then, I think you heard from uh, Dr. Patel a couple uh, minutes ago, we actually trained together in Cleveland. You'll see that we were trained by the same person, Dr. Culver. Um, and, uh, but this is the second point. What symptoms or what problems or organ dysfunctions do you have from your sarcoidosis? Very important thing to try to understand as you talk to your physicians. And then third, if you're being treated for sarcoidosis, what are the treatments that you're getting and what side effects can happen from, from, from those medications? Because as you heard maybe a couple times today, sometimes the treatment is worse than the disease, right? So those three things I think are the most important things for you to know. So let's go over those things. First thing is, as you know really well, sarcoidosis is a very a variable disease. There are a lot of different manifestations. Most patients uh, uh, will have some lung involvement, uh, but sometimes you can have uh, ocular involvement or ocular and cardiac involvement or skin involvement. It's a very different disease uh, uh, if we look at different patients. So I think uh, uh, that's one point, like I said, the first thing that you need to try to find out. In your case, where is the sarcoidosis in your body? And then, for the second point, let's go one by one. So let's go organ by organ and try to understand, number one, what symptoms do you have, right? So how do you feel? That's very important in sarcoidosis. And do you have any organ dysfunction uh, from that disease? Those are the things that you need to monitor. So for example, pulmonary sarcoidosis. So if you have sarcoidosis in your lungs, those are the symptoms, right? Cough, shortness of breath. And I think, as you heard before, those are the most important things to follow. Uh, the truth is, I think most of you don't really care what is your forced vital capacity, the number in your breathing test. It's more important, how are you feeling? Are you short of breath? Can you walk around your house without being out of breath? Are you having a lot of cough or not? So follow up with those symptoms is very important. But of course, sometimes we want to check the function of your organ as well, and we do that by the pulmonary function test. Uh, we can do also oximetry. We can check your oxygen as you, as, as you walk, especially if you have a low oxygen already. Uh, I think those are important things to do to see how is your organ function. And then important as well, chest x-ray, CT scan, we need to take a, take a picture of your lungs and see how, how, how uh, uh, they're, they're doing. But as we know, this doesn't correlate that much with the way you feel. We have patients with a lot of inflammation, a lot of uh, uh, disease in the lungs, but they feel great. We have patients with a completely normal CAT scan and they feel a lot of shortness of breath. That's why I think symptoms is really on, 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 on the top. 
Uh, how often do you follow up? It really depends on how bad your symptoms are, how bad your organ dysfunction is. Sometimes you do one month, three months follow up. If things are a little bit better, then you can do every six months. But I think those are important things to know about pulmonary sarcoidosis. What if you have ocular sarcoidosis? Those are the symptoms that you can have. Redness, pain, uh, especially if you have uh, sarcoidosis on the front of your eyes. We call this anterior uveitis. Uh, but it can also be in the back of your eyes, posterior uveitis. If that's the case, you can have blurry vision, floaters. Those are symptoms that will be very important to follow as you monitor the disease, right? Very important. To check more objectively the function of your, of your vision, of your eyesight, you need the eye doctor. So that's a, a very important message here. Once you are diagnosed with sarcoidosis, you need to see the ophthalmologist at least once, but ideally even every year, especially if you have some inflammation uh, in your eyes. And again, how often you monitor this, it really depends on how bad the disease is. Sometimes the eye doctors want to see you one month later, some other times six months, one year later. It really depends on how severe your disease is. Moving on to cardiac sarcoidosis. Again, those are the symptoms, those are the things that you want to uh, check as you're being treated or, or followed by cardiac sar for cardiac sar sarcoidosis. Palpitations, right? Maybe the most common symptom is cardiac sarcoidosis. Syncope or blackout, passing out, this can happen as well. Or presyncope or, you know, almost passing out or lightheadedness, this is something that you can have as well. Um, if you have one of the manifestations of cardiac sarcoidosis called heart failure, if your heart muscle is weak, then you can have shortness of breath, you can have swelling of your legs. Those are the symptoms that you that you could have. Those are the things that you need to monitor as we treat you. Uh, but again, your organ function can also help us in, in making decisions. And I think those are the important tests that we can do. So if you have any rhythm problem uh, from your cardiac sarcoidosis, like heart block or arrhythmias, EKG is a good thing to follow. Uh, sometimes we do what we call ambulatory EKG or Holter, right? So this is something else that we can follow as well. If you have already a pacemaker or a defibrillator for the cardiac sarcoidosis, we can do pacemaker or ICD checks every three months, for example. We can even do that remotely. Um, and those are the things that we use to check your rhythm, the, the rhythm of your heart. If you have heart failure, then we, we want to see the strength of the heart, the echocardiogram. You see a picture here of, of an echocardiogram is a good way to monitor your disease. There are some important numbers there. I think the most important one is the ejection fraction. Uh, as you may know, it measures how strong is your heart, especially your left ventricle. Nowadays, you may, you may have heard of this global longitudinal strain that's like a fancy term. Uh, but more recently, you have to pay more attention to this specific number in your echo report. Not everybody does it, but I think more and more people will start doing this. This seems to be more sensitive than the ejection fraction. So even if that number, the ejection fraction, is normal, we can still see some abnormal strain, and this seems to be important in sarcoidosis. So this is something that I think it's useful also in some cases to do that monitoring. Again, how often you do that, it depends on how bad things are. Sometimes every three months, every six months. Sometimes every year, things are going great. Um, but of course, because this is cardiac sarcoidosis, right? We're talking about the heart now. I think we need to spend a little bit more time here. So there are two more slides, or maybe just one, on cardiac sarcoidosis. Because there are those uh, advanced technologies to, to take pictures of your heart, uh, the uh, two most uh, common ones, cardiac MRI and cardiac PET scan. Uh, they are very important to make the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, you may have heard of, of, of them uh, before or even today throughout the lectures. Um, but uh, they can be helpful in the follow-up too. They can be helpful in monitoring your disease. I'll make this point a couple times a day. I think the way you feel and the way you function is much better than any of those tests. But Sometimes they can still be helpful and, and we use them to, to make decisions, so I think it's important for you to know. So cardiac MRI, for example, let's say you have cardiac sarcoidosis and you had a cardiac MRI before treatment. 
there are two things, two main things that we look in the cardiac MRI. One is this T2 uh, abnormalities, again, fancy term in radiology, but we believe that it measures inflammation, right? So we're going to see how much inflammation you have in your heart. And then the other fancy term that we use is this delayed gadolinium enhancement. Gadolinium, gadolinium is the contrast that we use in your MRI. We, we want to see if that uh, is lighting up in your, in your heart. And uh, that, we, we usually say that this is a scar tissue, but it can be inflammation as well. But those are the two main findings that we see on the report. As we treat you for your cardiac sarcoidosis, of course, we'll check how you feel, how you, you function, but we are also probably going to check this in, in the follow-up uh, to see how things are going. Cardiac PET scan as well. Uh, if you have cardiac sarcoidosis, if you had a cardiac PET scan to diagnose the disease, that may be useful in the future to monitor how things are going. And uh, we basically look at two things there as well. We give you a contrast uh, called FDG. That's a glucose with a special marker and it measures inflammation also. So you want to see if this marked glucose goes to your heart and we'll, we'll check inflammation that way. So the amount of FDG uptake can also tell us if you're responding to treatment, if the inflammation is going down. But we also checked this perfusion defect. We checked how open are your blood vessels in, in your heart. And uh, that tells us about inflammation, but also about scar tissue. If you have scar tissue in one area of your heart, you won't see inflammation at all, but there's no blood flow going there either. So we see this perfusion defect. Two things that we can use to monitor your disease, um, but in my mind, I think the most important thing is how you feel, how you function. Um, how often you do those tests, very controversial. You'll see centers that do a little bit like sooner, every three months or something. Um, I actually, I do at least six months uh, later, but ideally nine months, 12 months. Uh, uh, I don't think we know that well uh, how to respond to those abnormalities, especially if you're doing fine. Right? Let's say if you're feeling better, your echo, your heart function is getting better. If we see still a little bit of inflammation there, I don't think we are sure how significant that is. Then what about neurosarcoidosis? So if you have neurosarcoidosis, your monitoring will be completely different, right, than somebody who has cardiac or pulmonary sarcoidosis. Those are the symptoms, right? So if you have uh, neurosarcoidosis in your brain, uh, you may have stroke-like symptoms, weakness, uh, 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 facial paralysis. If you have in the spinal cord, some of those things can happen as well, weakness, paralysis, uh, numbness. Uh, but even if you don't have anything in your brain or spinal cord, if you have problem in your nerves, uh, you know, those symptoms can happen as well. A lot of numbness, tingling sensation on, on your feet and hands, burning sensation. Um, so uh, there are some types of neuropathies that can happen in sarcoidosis that would give you those symptoms. If you have those and if you're being treated for that, that's how you monitor. You see how your symptoms are and you, that's how we physicians and you patients will know if things are going in the right direction. But again, if you want to check the function of your organs, as far as neurosarcoidosis goes, we need a neurologic exam, right? So very important there uh, to uh, be in a center that has a neurologist, for example, that knows about sarcoidosis, gears for patients with sarcoidosis, so that we'll be able to check how, how your function um, is, is responding to treatment. And of course, there are tests that we can do. So if you had a lumbar puncture in the beginning of your disease, maybe showing some inflammation in your spinal fluid, that could give us some good information in the future. If you had the MRI, you see a picture of an MRI there on the left with a spinal cord lesion. So if you have a MRI in the beginning, we can follow up that MRI in the future also to see if you're responding to treatment. And most of the time, uh, we do. Uh, those are the the, the, the terms that you, you'll be looking in your reports, right? So T2 abnormalities, uh, delayed gadolinium enhancement, the same as the cardiac MRI actually. And you want to see if those things are getting better. Cutaneous sarcoidosis, um, uh, those are some of the manifestations that you can have. But uh, I think, especially cutaneous sarcoidosis, the way you feel, uh, it's really the most important thing. So we're going to see how the lesions are responding to treatment. How are you feeling about that? And uh, uh, you know, a, a facial lesion may be nothing for one patient, but it may be very disturbing for another patient. So
So we need to treat those those uh, patients differently. We need to monitor them differently and change treatment differently as well. Um, what if you have uh, renal sarcoidosis, like sarcoidosis in your kidneys, or if you have also calcium abnormalities, if your calcium is high, this happens in sarcoidosis. So for renal failure, you could be retaining fluid, having leg swelling, right? This is one thing that you need to monitor, make sure that this is getting better. If you have kidney stones, right, you feel it, a lot of pain, uh, and we need to make sure that this is getting better as well, that you're having less episodes of kidney stones. Uh, if your calcium is, is elevated, uh, this can give you confusion, for example, body aches. Those are the things that we, we want to see getting better as, as we treat. But if we want to check the function of, of your kidney, for example, then we check the creatinine. Uh, this is a number in your blood test that will tell us how things are going. Uh, if we want to see how the calcium is responding, of course, we have to measure the calcium in the blood, sometimes in the earring. And um, something that I think is very important is to uh, uh, measure both types of vitamin D. The active 125 vitamin D that can be high in sarcoidosis and also the inactive, the 25 uh, vitamin D. I put this picture there because I, I think it's one message that I always try to tell my patients. Uh, we should think a little bit differently about vitamin D when it comes to sarcoidosis because the granulomas that we see under the microscope when we do biopsies which is like the hallmark of sarcoidosis, they activate vitamin D. So they, they get 25 vitamin D, the inactive vitamin D, and they activate to 125. So if we measure in patients with sarcoidosis only the 25, that could be low, right? But we also need to measure the active one, the 125, because the granuloma is, is, is making that active vitamin D uh, uh, frequently. Um, so this, I think, is an, is an important message, especially if, if you are receiving vitamin D supplementation. I think it's important to keep an eye uh, on those numbers. And again, how often we do that? It, it depends, right? Sometimes we check blood work every month, every, every three months. It depends on how things are. And um, of course, a lot of other things can happen in sarcoidosis. This is a summary of the other organ manifestations things that can happen, things that we can do to monitor. So if you have liver sarcoidosis, we want to make sure that we check uh, 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 often the liver enzymes, AST, ALT, those are measurements of uh, injury to the liver. But we also we want to check the function of your liver. Albumin, for example, it's a very important protein that the, the liver makes. We need to take a look at that. If you have sarcoidosis in your spleen, sometimes that uh, destroy the platelets. This is one type of cell that we have in our blood and we can have a low platelet count and this can even cause some uh, uh, bleeding disorder for example. Uh, sometimes with the spleen sarcoidosis you have a lot of pain in your belly. We need to follow that as well. It's an important thing to follow when you monitor patients. If you have sarcoidosis in your bone marrow, uh, that's where our cells are produced. So you can have a low number of cells, white cell, red blood cell, the lately count and if we are treating you for that we need to monitor those numbers as well. If you have sarcoidosis in your bone or in your joints, pain is the main manifestation, that's how we'll monitor you if we treat you for that. And if you have sinonasal sarcoidosis or sarcoidosis in your sinuses, nasal congestion for example, it's a very common symptom, that's what will be following uh, uh, when, we, when we treat you. Those were the organ-related symptoms. So if you have sarcoidosis in one organ, lung, heart, then those are the symptoms that you, that you can have. That's what we need to monitor. But as you know really well, a lot of symptoms are not associated to any organ, uh, but they're very common in sarcoidosis. So fatigue, pain, concentration problems, memory problems, sleeping problems, right? We can't pinpoint any organ that will cause those, but this is really at least in my experience, maybe the, the, the thing that bothers you most. And uh, we definitely need to keep an eye on those symptoms as, as we treat you, right? Uh, if, if I'm giving you medication, your numbers are getting better on the uh, pulmonary function test, your uh, inflammation is getting better in your lungs, but you still feel horrible, I, I, I need to do something else, right? We need to do something else to try to get you in the, uh, in the right direction. So those symptoms are important to keep an eye also. Um, then I think this is probably the, the last slide or one of the last slides. Um, at some point we may decide to treat you and uh, 
I'll say that again, sometimes the treatment is worse than the disease. So you need to be aware, okay, this is the medication that I'm getting, those are the side effects that I could get, and, uh, and uh, uh, this is what I need to monitor. I think you're gonna get a, hear a lecture from Dr. Boffman a little bit about steroids, but uh, those are some of the side effects that you can have, a lot of side effects that you can get from prednisone. You definitely need to monitor those as you are being treated for sarcoidosis. A lot of times we need to lower the dose or stop it because of those side effects. If you're using one of our second line agents, methotrexate, azathioprine, lefloxide, then uh, I think one of the most important things to do is to check blood work regularly, sometimes every month, every six weeks. Uh, if you are on a more stable dose, every three months, every six months, it really depends on, on, on how, how stable your dose is. Uh, and check for the cell counts, for the liver function, all of those things are important. If you're taking plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, you need to see the eye doctor every 6 to 12 months to make sure that you're not having one side effect that you can have in, in your eye from, from, from plaquenil. Mm -hmm. It's very rare to have this uh, 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 side effect in the eye. Uh, less than 1% of the patients, especially with the doses that we use in sarcoidosis, a little bit lower than, than usual but it's still important to, to keep an eye on that. And if you are on infliximab or adalimumab, the medication that we call TNF blockers, the risk of infection is a little bit higher, so you need to watch for that. We need to check for, for example, prior exposure to tuberculosis to make sure that you're not going to uh, reactivate that once we give you those medications, and also check blood work regularly. Uh, so take home points, back to those three things that I think you should be aware. So number one, Try to identify where the sarcoidosis is in your body. If you don't know that, it'll be very tough to know how to monitor your disease. So I think that's the first thing that you need to try to find out. And a quick message here, even if you have no eye or heart symptoms, uh, we, we need to check at least once with the ophthalmologist and at least get an EKG to make sure that everything is okay with the heart. Second, once you know where the sarcoidosis is, try to identify what symptoms and what organ dysfunctions are being caused by the sarcoidosis. Those are the most important things to monitor. And then third, depending on what treatment you're getting, you need to monitor for side effects as well. So with that, I'll finish. And this is my family. They are the ones who will be coming for the uh, state fair in August with me. And I'm uh, open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have some good questions that were submitted, and I'm going to get you with a couple of good ones. Um, what questions should I challenge my pulmonologist with? Yeah, I, maybe a good uh, frame is, is this, those three points. So ask, where is my sarcoidosis, right? So, so that's, that's the first thing. And then uh, from the symptoms that you're having, what, what does he think or she think that the, the sarcoidosis is, is the culprit? Because those are the things that, that, you'll, that you'll track once you're being treated. And then uh, second, always ask about side effects of the medications that they're giving you, especially prednisone. We make, make sure that you, you talk about those things with your pulmonologist. There's one. That, um, how, often, I don't know. Um, how often or how, how common is it to go from one type of sarcoidosis to another? For example, I have um, pulmonary and uh, the other one. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so how often then is it that that can go into the heart or any other organ for that matter? Yeah, so it depends on, on the organ. Uh, the heart, for example, to have a significant uh, manifestation of, of sarcoidosis in your heart, it, it's not common. It's probably 5% or less to have really something significant. Uh, but if you have skin sarcoidosis, for example, the chance of you to have sarcoidosis in your lungs is pretty high just because sarcoidosis in the lungs is, is the most common manifestation. Usually, if you're going to have other organ manifestation, it usually happens early in the disease, maybe within the first year, first two years. I think that's the period that you really need to be watching for new symptoms and, and, uh, and new manifestations. Uh, 
We have a couple questions about staging. Some say stage two is worse than stage three, Sark. Why or why not? And can stage three just stay in the lungs? How common is it? Can you talk, yeah. touch on the staging? Correct. I, I think this is a great point. And even across the, uh, the street, we are having a lot of discussions about this staging as well. Um, um, I think we know a few things about the staging, but we don't know a lot of things. So in my, for me, the take home point is, um, I think there are different types of, of the disease, right? So maybe the right term is even like type, and not, not, not stage, because they don't necessarily progress from one to another. But I think there are different types of the disease. Um, and you know, if you have uh, uh, stage one sarcoidosis with just sarcoidosis in your lymph glands, the manifestations will be very different than somebody who has a stage four, which is this scar tissue, scar tissue in the lungs. Um, so I think it's uh, different types of, of the diseases. The monitoring will be different, right? The symptoms will be different. I think this is a, a, a message. And they don't necessarily progress from one to two to three to four. In fact, most of the time this doesn't happen. Well, sarcoidosis always come back when there's recurrences. Is that something that patients can come to expect? Yeah, I think it depends on for how long you have your disease. If you have your disease for more than two, three, five years, then I think at this point it's fair to, to call this chronic sarcoidosis and to expect that the symptoms will be coming back. The goal at that point is to manage sarcoidosis as any other chronic disease like diabetes, high blood pressure, Maybe we'll not be able to cure you from sarcoidosis at that point, but we can try to control the disease, decrease the amount of flares, decrease the amount of symptoms, give you a better quality of life. But if you're still early in the process, like you just diagnosed with sarcoidosis, depending on the type of sarcoidosis, there is still a good chance that things will go in the right direction and resolve. Can it ever just go away? You can. So, so again, depending on the uh, manifestation, some of them are easier to go away. So lung sarcoidosis, skin sarcoidosis, for example, if it's early in the disease, it's easier to go away and it's possible. But some others are a little bit harder. So uh, brain sarcoidosis, for example, uh, cardiac sarcoidosis, depending on the, on the severity. I mean, high calcium, for example, that's another one. Bone sarcoidosis, those are types that it's, they are a little bit harder to make it go away. When we see those, we are already thinking that maybe this will be a long-term and then last question, um, can you touch on diet and exercise, anything we know um, or that doctors can suggest to their patients? Yeah, so we, we, we probably don't have like a lot of good studies proving that those things are good. For, for exercise, we definitely have for other lung diseases. So we, there's a lot of, there are studies showing that pulmonary rehabilitation or exercise is good for patients with COPD or other types of lung diseases. So I think the recommendation there is a little bit stronger. We believe the exercise is very good for your lung, for your sarcoidosis, for your quality of life. Um, diet, I think we don't have a lot of uh, evidence, but more and more we are talking about the uh, anti-inflammatory diet for other inflammatory diseases. And uh, I don't know, I think for me it makes sense, maybe in the near future we'll be seeing more studies talking about this uh, anti-inflammatory diet in, in, in sarcoidosis with less animal-based uh, 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 food and more plant-based uh, food, but uh, I think we need more, more data before we make strong recommendations there. The big message for me in that scenario is, yes, we treat your, we treat your sarcoidosis with medications, but that's really not the only thing that we need to do. We need to always uh, uh, keep an eye for those other things, exercise, hobbies, uh, a lifestyle, mindfulness activities, uh, 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 group activities. I think those things are important also to take care of you as a whole and, and make, you, make you feel better and not only like give you medications and, and see you in three or six months or so. Thank you so much. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Boffman, who's joining us from the 